Okay. Hello, everyone. All right, we're getting live on Facebook. My recording is ready. All right, we'll give it one more second for Amy to get back. She's getting a drink of water. And then we'll get the club started. And we'll also wait for more people to join. I'm not seeing any of the gallery. Oh, we're in a webinar, Barbara, so we won't see any of the participants, just each other. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. If you're just joining us now, we're going to start in just a minute. I'm going to wait for a few more people to join us, and then Amy will be back in on the Zoom. She was just grab grabbing a quick drink of water. And I'll just run through my quick spiel about the webinar features right now before I introduce Amy. Um, if you're going to ask questions to Amy during this, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. If you want to chat with each other openly to everybody, use the chat section. I'll be checking the Q&A uh, section throughout the night and in about an hour into this event, I'll start interjecting with your questions. And if you're joining from Facebook, um, I'll be checking the comment section too and asking your questions on here. Um, and Amy's back, so we'll get started. So everyone, welcome to another Birchfield Penny Book Club. I can't tell you how excited I am to introduce our guest this evening. Um, she's author, poet, and my former professor, Amy Nizuka Matatio. Um, and I just walked through my brief spiel on how to use the Zoom webinar. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Barbara. Well, Michaela, I didn't know that she was your former professor. You certainly are the one who should be taking over tonight. Um, before, before we have Amy introduce herself and her book, I'd like to read you one of the reviews that is included on the back cover of her book, if you have the book, by author um, Scott Russell Sanders, because I think it beautifully... Um, sums up what I have felt about reading her book and what I have come to know about her as an author. He says, these are the praise songs of a poet working brilliantly in prose. Each essay compresses a great deal of art and truth into a small space, whether about fireflies or flamingos, monkeys or monsoons, childhood or motherhood, are the trials and triumphs of living with brown skin in a dominant white world. You will not find a more elegant, exuberant braiding of natural and personal history. And interestingly, some of that personal history, in fact, quite, quite a number of years of it, involved Western New York, where Amy lived two different times in her life. Uh, and and that is incorporated into a couple of different essays in the book with interesting conclusion. So Amy, um, you have said that my books are born of love and wonder. And I'd like you to just start by telling us about yourself, about your books, an introduction to where you'd like to begin in talking with us tonight. Well, thank you, Barbara, and so lovely to be with you um, again, Michaela. Um, 
I'm coming to you all from Oxford, Mississippi now, um, where I, I teach. I'm, um, I'm actually off this semester, so I'll go back to teaching in January. Mm -hmm. So I'm so um, thrilled to be able, although I wish we could be there um, all together in person. Um, I love taking my family to the Birchfield Penny and, um, and then going out for Indian food after. So um, that museum has a special place in, in my family's um, life as well. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that quote that you mentioned, uh, my books are born of love and wonder. That's kind of how I've always started um, in writing. Um, that's not to be prescriptive by any means, but for mm -hmm. example, for this book in particular, um, it was uh, a result. I, I kind of was making a list for my kids of, um, I had 200 plants and animals that I was so, um, not that I'm an expert in any of these, but, and I wouldn't even consider them my favorites necessarily, but they're the 200 animals and plants that I was so curious about and had so many questions about that I don't think I could ever get tired ever learning about. So each one of these, the cassowary, the comb jelly, the peacock, I could have done a single volume on. Um, so that was kind of my litmus test on how to go from 200 to 28 um, plants and animals. And um, really it was, it came from, I, I, what I, why I was making this list is because it was actually kind of during the 2016 presidential campaign, um, I, my, my eldest was at the time um, eight or nine years old. My youngest um, was uh, six. And um, they had a lot of questions about why anyone would want to build a wall. Um, they didn't know what the phrase, mommy, you know, they were saying, mommy, what does build that wall mean? Build the wall or build that wall or something. And they didn't know why a grown man was calling women, um, names that were not appropriate, you know, let's put it that way. So I didn't have the answers to any of these questions, how I could translate those to a kid. And so that was my response was actually making a list of like, mm -hmm. not to deflect by any means, but to say, hey, these are what I have so many questions and curiosity about the world. Look how amazing this planet is. And I wanted mm -hmm. to kind of yeah, I guess in some ways redirect, but in another way, I wanted to put this Kind of sadness. It was a deep sadness about the state of our um, country, mm -hmm. how people are reacting towards each other. And I wanted to kind of refocus that sadness into joy and wonderment and curiosity again. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, and we can talk a little bit more about that. But another question I had when I was kind of compiling this uh, book is because I didn't know I was writing a book first. I was really, I had two pairs of eyeballs in mind and those were a nine-year-old and, um, and a six-year-old. And, you know, obviously in revisions, I was thinking of a larger audience, but um, what I've been so proud about is that you could see, I think, even after, you know, several revisions, you could see moments of tenderness. I think you can see a little bit how, there's a voice of either a dear friend or a mother figure, or there's a tenderness there, I think, that doesn't always come across in nature writing and environmental books because the original audience was my son's. And I thought that that was kind of, I loved having that direction and that attention because frankly, I didn't see books like that when I was growing up. And I loved and I read voraciously science and nature but I never saw anybody that looked even remotely like me who also loved the outdoors, who, and if, if they were a woman, they certainly didn't have kids. If they were a woman, they weren't married. If they were a woman, they didn't like pop music or makeup or, you know, pop culture or anything like that. So I wanted to showcase that you could have many dimensions, you know, as Walt Whitman says, um, do I contain multitudes? Very well, I contain multitudes that you don't have to be just, just, uh, you know, Birkenstocks wearing granola, you know, and nothing wrong with any of those, but that that person could also love ridiculous pop music and makeup and have crushes on boys and have kids or not, you know, or just, you know, to, to be multifaceted in the outdoors, I think hasn't been 
explored nearly as much as it, as it could be. And so I had all of that kind of swirling around in my mind as I was putting this together. Yeah. Um, Barbara, I have a um, just like four slides I'd love to share. And then um, I know you have some questions too and stuff like that. And then can I do that right now? Would this be a good yes, time? Yes, that would be good. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Bear with me here. So those of you who don't, hang on one second here. Those of you who haven't seen this book, it is actually illustrated. So that's something I'm very um, proud of and happy about because several people rejected it um, on the basis of me wanting to have illustrations. And I, I really just wanted to call back to that kind of, again, that sense of wonderment that I had as a kid um, reading through, you know, the science books in our library. You know, um, my parents would always drop me off in the kids section and I'd scurry over <laughs> to the grownups, the adult section of science and nature. And, you know, usually those books in the 70s and early 80s had one color, if that. Uh, and then it was illustrated. So I wanted to kind of showcase um, that. Let me, let me show you some illustrations though real quick. Oops. So this is by um, an artist I found on Instagram of all, all places. She's a Japanese American artist named Fumi Nakamura. And I thought that was really important to not only have my name on the book, but to have um, an Asian American illustrator as well. Because like I said, I just simply, I never even read a book or saw a movie or a music video from MTV that simply had an Asian American woman or girl just outside doing anything at all, let alone smiling, let alone just being outside. So I didn't have the vocabulary for it, I don't think, um, as a kid. But after a while, imagine going your whole life, never seeing anybody do the thing that you love doing, which is being out, just simply being outside. It's so weird. It's such a weird, astonishing absence. And now my kids have, you know, they have Dora the Explorer for cartoons. They have a whole, um, you know, television and movies and books are so much more um, diverse. And that's on ways to love each other, ways to move, economic despair, you know, differences. Um, I didn't have that growing up in the 70s and 80s, at least the libraries and syllabi that I had um, growing up didn't include that. So I really wanted, um, I was so glad when my publisher not only loved the idea of illustrations, but didn't even flinch when I said I would really want there to be, um, I, I, re I really want the, the illustrator to be Asian American as well. Um, and so let me see, I wanted to back up just a little bit. These were the kind of the questions I was kind of asking myself as I was um, digging through this list of 200. And that is, so yes, that's, first of all, that's four-year-old me. In my favorite place, one of my favorite places, and that is in my parents' garden. This is in Chicago, Illinois. And I wanted to ask you all, um, let me see, Michaela, are participants able to type in the chat or does it not show up? Yes, it will show up in the chat. Yeah. I wanted to ask you all if you can, if you're able to, to type in the chat, um, where do you feel at home in the outdoors? Like, where does your breath change? Where do your shoulders fall down a little bit? Like, for me, it's always, and my parents now live in central Florida, they're retired, but the place where I can just fully, fully relax, even I think more so than my own home now with my family is just when my parents are, and when I'm just around the plants and fruits and vegetables that my parents have planted, and that's in their garden in Florida. So that's always been a place of safety and um, enjoyment and wonder for me. Can you type in the chat, like maybe you're an ocean person, or maybe you need to be up in the mountains. Maybe you like the lake, you need to see the lake since you're there, since we're right here in um, Lake Erie. Um, maybe you just need to be able to see fall leaves in Western New York. That's your happy place. What is your kind of safe space, your happy place in the outdoors? If you could share that in the chat, that would be great. And something else I was asking of myself and librarians, you know, the library has been a place of home and safety for me my whole life. 
um, is where are, just simply where are the stories of Asian Americans who love out, the outdoors, outside? Uh, I just simply, I know I'm not the first and I'm not the only by any means. I, I, I absolutely want to make that clear. It's just publishers were not taking those chances. You know, even when I was shopping my book around, so many times people would say, hey, um, can you make this like the Asian American Thoreau, like uh, Walden, you know, that kind of thing. And I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Um, not that I, and I teach Walden, I teach Thoreau um, in my nature writing classes, but let's not forget uh, Thoreau's mom was doing his laundry while he was outside. You know, I, I wanted to, I wanted to showcase a form of nature writing that hadn't ever been, um, that, haven't, ha that hadn't happened in this way before with illustrations, um, with a multifaceted um, narrator. And I wanted to also be aware that, and I wanted to kind of always keep that in my, in my mind, in the back of my mind, that not everybody feels like the outdoors is a place of safety. Um, for example, you know, I mean, just off the top of my head, I have a very dear um, friend who is African-American and he, um, you know, he's a former linebacker in college football. Uh, he does not feel safe in a forest. Um, and, you know, for an African-American man, uh, being in the woods at night is not a place of safety. And I think a lot of times books forget that the people have different senses mm -hmm. of being, you know, like for me, I, I absolutely felt more scared in Western New York in a parking lot mm -hmm. than I ever did, um, say, walking the maple, um, maple in the maple trees of Gowanda, New York. You know what I mean? Like, so um, say Fredonia's Walmart parking lot was absolutely a place um, where I did not feel safe. And yet feeling, walking around in the woods just outside of um, what was then a, a a mental health facility in Gowanda, New York, I was abs I felt absolutely safe there. So I wanted to be aware that not everybody feels safe and for many different reasons, that kind of thing. Things that I just never saw addressed in nature writing. Um, and so, and then just as a small little thing, I wanted to showcase um, one of the chapters in here. Uh, I wanted you to see the actual bird. There's an illustration of the potu in the book, but I wanted to showcase the, the bright yellow, as much as I think Fumi Nakamura nailed it with her illustration, I think it just makes people smile when you get to see on the left here, this is what a potu looks like at night. And on the right, this is a mama and a baby potu um, sleeping camouflage right out in the open in the daytime. So it's just one of my favorite birds. I wanted to share that with everybody. And, um, and then I think what I will do right now is, um, Maybe just read just a little, little bit and then um, we'll chat more with, uh, with Barbara. All right, uh, is my screen off? Okay, great. Um, I'm gonna read just a little bit from a chapter called Comb Jelly, which is one of my favorite, um, it's actually this blobby character here. And if you don't know what a comb jelly is, that'll be your only homework assignment for today is to <laughs> comb jelly. I put it on the chat there. Um, oops, let me see, let me put it for everyone. Um, look up a video of what a comb jelly, how it moves, that kind of thing. And oh, I'm liking the um, responses here. A walk in the park. Yeah, parks in Western New York are so beautiful. Walking in the hills, Linda, good. Skiing with fresh snow, of course, of course. Um, yeah, and Marlene, when something unexpected happens, that's my favorite part when the moon just all of a sudden you see it out of nowhere so beautiful good good all right so this is a small chapter on the comb jelly um who on earth would think to give solid glass bracelets to a four-year-old my eyes were as big as quarters when i opened the box of bangles sent by my indian grandmother she thought it was time and i loved them right away the shock of color when I held up my thin wrists up to the sunny window, the clink and chime when I ran, the deep drenched reds, blues, violets, nothing else rang so bold or brilliant in a Chicago winter. Outside, drifts piled higher than a toddler in moon boots. 
My father shoveled snow off our roof for fear of a cave-in. But I had my bangles. I ran from room to room just to ring them. Be careful, be careful, my mother said. You'll cut yourself if they break. And when I finally grew tired, I'd lie on the floor of our living room and listen for the strange sounds of winter. The scream of icicles as they slid off the edge of the gutters, the vermiculite in the cool soil of a houseplant begging for a drink. I held the, the bangles up to the ceiling light so I could fracture a rainbow across the room. So much power in a tiny bracelet of glass. The first time such radiance sprang from this little girl's hand. As an adult, I'm still so drawn to light-soaked color displays. Some of the planet's most vibrant light shows come not from the land or air, but from the ocean. With the pulse and undulation of the comb jelly, hundreds of thousands of cilia flash mini rainbows, even in the darkest polar and tropical ocean zones. This zing of color is what tempts people all up and down the eastern coast of both Americas to gather walnut-sized comb jellies into their hand. But don't do this. Most are so delicate, thinner than the thinnest contact lens, that they will simply disintegrate in your palm. If you want to observe one up close, scoop it into a clear cup and take a look-see that way. And then, of course, please gently return it to the water. Now, the comb jelly is a creature of delicacy. It doesn't sting, and it's not actually a jellyfish. It belongs to a whole other phylum, Tenophora. Comb jellies can be as small as a single grain of rice, or they can grow to over four feet in width, large enough, in theory, to gobble up a whole plump second grader. And uh, <laughs> I remember when I wrote that, uh, I had a second grader, and I put that in there to scare him, and he still, to this day, won't read this chapter. Uh, but they won't, they won't swallow them up because they are too busy waving their hair like cilia around, too busy eating various fish eggs, and too busy eating other comb jellies. And I think I'll just pause there for right now just to give a little taste of um, one of the chapters um, from World of Wonders. <laughs> every, every chapter just spins you off into other chapters. And it's a very circular book in this way. It spins us off into our own memories, into deep feelings of what you're expressing, the tenderness mm. with which you talk about handling the comb jelly and respecting its life and its um, fragileness. And all of that is eye-opening and instructional in itself. I, you, uh, you referred in that to your Indian grandmother. Mm -hmm. Would you just clarify for our group what your ancestry is? Because in many of your essays, you refer to a, a brown girl in a white society or not, um, not seeing authors and writers or uh, characters on television, so on, who looked like you. And um, so yeah. many of your experiences are related to that. So what is your ancestry and how has that affected where you've lived in the United States or how have those places affected you? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, so yeah, my mother is from the Philippines and my father is from South India. Um, so the very tip of India is Kerala. And um, they were both diehard Elvis Presley fans and they met, <laughs> I, so they were, they had been watching Elvis movies in the 60s in India and the Philippines. They met um, in the late 60s in Chicago, Illinois. And their very first date was one of the last times Elvis ever played live in Chicago, actually. <laughs> so it's so funny and wild to me that I live 45 minutes away from Graceland, which is Elvis's home um you know they famously say uh no other residence gets more visitors in the country except for the white house um besides graceland and um anyway yeah so uh and i was born in chicago and um so my indian grandparents um 
were not thrilled, <laughs> I don't think. And I think it's safe <laughs> to say they were, my Filipino grandparents were not thrilled either um, for various reasons. You know, my dad is Catholic, my mom is Methodist. Um, you know, I think, uh, mm, you know, my dad, my Indian side of the family kind of pretty much expected women to stay home and they were very traditional in that way and my mom was absolutely modern and contemporary and was a doctor and in no way shape or form had any interest in staying home um and my um, that's part of my they they loved each other you know so um it was kind of like this amazing uh this amazing way that they communicated, um, of course they communicated in English, but they their shared love has always been um, the garden. So mm. if we were in Chicago, Illinois, and they were trying to you know, grow pineapples indoors, or they were always trying mm. to grow things that reminded them of their homes, uh, mm -hmm. and to do that in Chicago is you know, almost <laughs> probably, basically. Uh, and that has, you know, they, we traveled all over when we, when we first lived in Gowanda, New York, we had um, this beautiful kind of screened in sun porch. And I know they were trying to grow um, tropical plants. They, they did grow tropical plants in, in, indoors and, you know, neighbors would always come around and be like, oh, how do you get these flowers blooming? They just always had such a great knack for it. And now they're in Florida um, because they said that that is the only place in this continental US where um, things that they love from India and the Philippines can grow finally outdoors and not just have to keep it indoors or worry about a freeze or mostly not worry about a freeze um, and, and things like that. So, so yeah, so my, and my mother was, um, and just to give a little bit more of a background, what took us to Western New York in the first place is my mother, um, they're both retired now, but she was a psychiatrist. So she had these contracts that took her to, from mental health facility to mental health facility. And in the 70s and 80s in particular, um, many of them have shut down now, including the one in Gowanda. And I believe that one right there, Buffs, or is the one at Buffalo, right near Birchville Penny, is that still going on? I don't know. I think they converted that or something. It's been converted. It's, yeah. But it, it still has services okay. and, and some residents, but much of the property has been changed to other things. It's funny, you know, growing up, that was like the big, the big headquarters of the, the big mental yeah. health facility, Kawanda, mm -hmm. was a very small one. Right. Um, and so my mom would have to go, you know, oftentimes would have to drive up from Gowanda to, to Buffalo for various things. And so, yeah, a Western New York figures pretty heavy still in my childhood mm -hmm. memories, mm -hmm. but it was, we lived on the grounds of various mental health facilities, which you would think it um, would be scary or terrifying, you know, in Kansas, in Gowanda, those were absolutely places of joy and wonderment. Um, one, as my mom says, it's one of the safest places you could be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I didn't know this at the time, but we always had secure, we were on security cameras all the time because there many doctors did not have kids. Um, we were some, my younger sister and I were something of a novelty. So the security, we were always mm -hmm. surveilled, which sounds, I think a little bit creepy, but it was also comforting to know that you know, nothing could happen to us really uh, because we were always um, being monitored, you know, and we were good kids, you know, I think the naughtiest thing we ever did was, I think, drive by, um, or drive by, I say drive, I'm on my bikes, I'm on like a three-speed bike, <laughs> uh, like wave to patients that maybe we shouldn't be waving to patients, you know, that kind of thing, but the, you know, these mental health facilities had beautiful forests and, um, creek sometimes and you could just go tromping around yeah yes in your writing you've mentioned a sense of freedom um you were you were not having to um, be called in to the house and and, yeah. you, and so you had time and space to stop and wonder and look and discover and ask ask your own questions about things and that kind of openness and freedom and lack of fear and wonderment about the things that you were seeing 
was a very privileged kind of experience. In the classes that you teach, the students you encounter have not had that kind of upbringing nor childhood that was primarily um, freewheeling and loose and natural. They've grown up indoors with technology, with answers given mm -hmm. or tests given, um, learning based on um, taught knowledge. How, how has our educational system affected the development of a sense of wonder mm. in children? You've had young children mm -hmm. and you've also then seen and experienced contemporary schooling and also a whole generation that you teach on the college level. What changes do you see that educational systems have affected? Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Um, wow, there's a lot in your comments. They're so great. You know, <laughs> that's so good. So let me see. I could do a whole lecture on on your questions there. Um, I think one thing I'll say, just just to give a different perspective too. It's funny. Um, you know, my, some of my college students, not all, but some almost look at me and they've said as much kind of, you know, with pity, like how, how sad you didn't, um, how you didn't grow up with, uh, cell phones or how did you communicate with people, you know, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And one, um, hang on one moment. It's, uh, sorry, and, uh, and then I say like, how sad that you are indoors, um, mm -hmm. you know? So it's it's kind of different perspectives in some ways. Now, some you're right. I'm. Um, you mentioned it's a it's a very privileged um, way to grow up. It's funny. I know when when you, I just want to clarify too because I think oftentimes people think um, many things about that situation about. Uh, kids who were just freewheeling and, and riding bikes around, I've had people say, so it doesn't seem like your parents cared much about you, <laughs> you know, or wanted to spend time with me. And then I've had other people who said like, oh, how lucky you got to, you know, basically be outdoors from like, basically we come in for meals and I can just tell you, you could see it on my face. I don't for a second think my parents um, were at all trying to get me out of the house. Maybe they were but I didn't feel at all any sense of, um, it was exciting, if anything, it was like, um, you know, they had to make me wait inside like so that I'd have a meal <laughs> and actually eat, um, that kind of thing. I felt so much joy mm -hmm. um, being outside. And I think they realized that too. Also, you know, I grew up with the mantra from both of my parents that, um, well, you know, I, and I hear myself saying it to my kids. So it's very, um, it's come full circle, <laughs> much to my kid's chagrin. Um, only boring people get bored, you know? Um, and so that's the kind of thing. So they didn't get, when you, when you say privilege, I think a lot of times people say, oh, your, your mom's a doctor. My friends will all vouch for me on this. They, they went out of their way to make sure I didn't feel at all like I had anything handed to me. Um, mm -hmm. And still to this day, maybe Michaela, you remember this from class. I still have issues with school supplies because my school supplies mm -hmm. were, you know, we would have off-brand crayons. I thought Crayola was such a, you know, exciting um, name brand thing. You know, we would just get the off-brand everything and um, barely, barely toys, basically, you know, um, bikes that were just the basic bike, nothing fancy, nothing like that. Otherwise, we, my sister and I were left to our own devices to make our own games and fun and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And that has been the single greatest gift that my parents gave me is letting myself have time to daydream and wonder. So 
I would say the kids now, some of them, you're right, absolutely don't have that option. And that is truly unfortunate. And for whatever reason, either that it's not safe, frankly, for them to go around, you know, and come back mm -hmm. at, at sunset. Um, but there are some kids still who have that option and they choose not to. Mm -hmm. And that's a bummer. Mm -hmm. And you know, the last thing that they need to hear when they come to college is, or, you know, or when I visit them in high school is you need to be outside. But my hope is, you know, there's a saying here in the South, you catch more flies with honey. My hope is that by showing like, look at all the things you're missing out on or that you could do, maybe, maybe you could, I'm not saying you have to cut screens or social media entirely, but maybe there could be a, a like maybe you can cut down a couple hours. Maybe you can see what it's like to walk on grass. You know, a lot of people don't know what that's like. Mm -hmm. um, just to even be barefoot in grass anymore, let alone like walk through a creek. You know, um, they just simply don't have that. And not because they're not, they're not allowed to, they just choose not to. So those are the students that I feel I want to reach extra, you know, to, to kind of shift their way of thinking a little bit. And for the people that weren't able to grow up in a place where it's after, where you can be safe outside, mm -hmm. um, that's the beauty of it. It's never too late now. Like you can, mm -hmm. and it's free, you know, um, barring another uh, lockdown, um, you can't, it doesn't cost anything to walk in the park. All these things that are in the um, chat here, it's just to, just the healing that you get by walking through a forest, hiking, th hiking through a forest, or just watching a sunset over the lake, you know, those are the kinds of things you can't get on a picture of a sunset um, on social media. You don't get the same kind of rush. You don't get that same surprise and delight. Amy, you, um, in your classes, some of the assignments, some of the activities that you've done with them to, to sort of um, nicely, but you're cordially expected to mm -hmm. um, jog them over that, that barrier. Things like your, your sky journals. Mm -hmm. This leads me into something else that I want you to talk about, which is naming. But mm -hmm. would you talk about some of those activities that you do, because even if they're not able to walk, even in parks mm -hmm. or things like that, there, there is their yard or the grass strip. Mm -hmm. And how often have they stopped and looked, really looked at a bee on a particular flower or is it true that a rose is a rose is a rose and a cloud is a cloud is a cloud? Mm -hmm. or, or, or do you do things with them that move them beyond that lack of experience? Yeah. Would you talk about some of those things that you do? Because I think they're informative for us. Mm -hmm. also. It's not just the college kids, it's all of us. Oh, absolutely. And I did this with... Um with group, you know, different workshops that I teach online um, where the average age is, um, you know, 70. Um, mm -hmm. So this, there, it's never too late. And it, the beauty of it is that you can do this in high school. You can do this when you're, um, you know, I say 18 to 81, you know, and beyond, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, the one you mentioned, the Sky Journal, that was developed during the onset of the pandemic, you know, mm -hmm. spring of 2020. Um, we were suddenly, you know, I, uh, we had spring break and then we just never returned. So it's like, um, it, it really, we, we never returned to campus. So, but we were still teaching from home and trying to figure out Zoom. So one way to kind of be connected with my students was I had them develop a sky journal. And that is just simply a notebook. Um, I usually have one near me, just a spiral notebook. It costs 50 cents, you know, doesn't have to be fancy. Many of them had fancier notebooks, blank notebooks laying around, but just 50 cent journal, spiral notebook. And to just see if you can um, identify, you know, there's 12 types of clouds out there. Um, if you, and everybody, I. I task them to, to teach them, teach themselves how to identify three clouds. So a quarter of the clouds that are out there. 
And, um, you know, this is, they needed to have an internet connection up at the very least so that they could look things up. But mostly they had to draw, they had to take pictures if they had a phone that they could take pictures and kind of study and kind of match up with um, books that they had, that they're able to check out from the library or, uh, you know, um, pictures of the different clouds that are available online. All you need to Google is types of clouds and you'll see them. And they were, so, that was this, um, such a transformative assignment. I had the, you know, I gave them about a month and a half to, to figure out at least three different clouds on site. So many of them said, Barbara, that they will always remember those clouds now. And then some of them were saying like, now I'm, I'm determined to learn all 12, you know, that kind of thing. So it doesn't mm -hmm. stop mm -hmm. when the semester ends. And it's so important, they said that, um, and why it's so important, I'll just give some of the responses is they said, you know, I could be driving home from work or, you know, walking with my, uh, with my mom, you know, um, in the, in a parking lot. And I suddenly noticed the thing that I learned the name of, and it's not just something that, you know, I, I just finished going about my day. I stop and actually notice it. And when you notice and know the names of something, you can't help. I've just never seen it. Otherwise you can't help, but feel a tenderness and almost like a proud, like, I, I know you, like this cloud, it sounds woo woo, but it's mm -hmm. like, oh, cumulus cloud, you're my friend, you're my buddy, I, I see you, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. That bird over there is not just bird, it's a yellow warbler or an indigo bunting, you know, they know it by name. So I feel like when you get to know things by name and not just, oh, that bird or that tree, you want to protect it. You want, it's, it's much harder to want to commit a violence or um, encourage the destruction of something that you know the name for, you know? And my hope is, is so instead of just saying like, oh, that patch of woods is gonna be cleared out for a new target, you'll have to reckon with yourself with knowing like, oh, there are seven different types of birds that use that patch of, four, of silver maples and birches um, and they all need those trees to survive, you know, that it's, it gives you pause rather than say, oh, clear this out for a target, you know, I use target because I love target, <laughs> but that makes you pause and realize the violence that's happening when you get to know the names of what the living things that are in there, you know, and my hope, Barbara, eventually is that once you get to know more of the names of living things on this planet and you know the names for the stuff around you, that that then, that grace extends to humans. So it's harder to want to commit a violence against, I don't know, someone who is trans and you know their name is Betty or, you know, that kind of thing, or someone on the other side of this planet is not just Middle East, but, oh, there's a a sweet boy named Kava, you know what I mean? Like that, mm -hmm. it's, it's harder to want to dismiss um, anything living when you know the names of them. And I think that's what a lot of people in charge want us to do, just to think broadly and to think, hey, you know, it's us first, we gotta make ourselves great without giving care or consideration to others. So that's why, I mean, it's all connected. It's so connected. It's not just, oh, you get to know the name of one squid and then that's it, your life changes. No, it becomes contagious. You'll want to know the name of other things. Exactly. Once you know the name for things, mm -hmm. you actually have a relationship. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And... <laughs> I'm, uh, I remember a, a poem that one of your audience wrote. Um, Virtually none of us before reading your book had ever heard of an oxalotl. Oh, okay. And, and someone wrote, no one knew of the oxalotl till Amy praised it. Mm. Now, a lotl. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that. Yeah, I but, love it so much. Yeah. I think things and people are depersonalized mm -hmm. by not having names. And this is one of the first principles of degradation and hate and propaganda and rejection. Take away 
the names. Absolutely. The you know identities. Mm -hmm. And just today, I heard four instances of this depersonalization, mm -hmm. this bunching it together into an anonymity. Mm -hmm. Someone said, I don't like animals. Mm -hmm. so another said, oh, I hate snakes. Mm. And my yard, yeah. one of my yard men said, oh, destroy all of those. They're just weeds. Oh, gosh. And it's just a bug. Step on it. That's mm. what one of the kids said. Yeah. Just a bug. Mm. They're just weeds. Yeah. Um, just. I hate snakes, period. Mm -hmm. um, and and this, this is what makes it so easy to categorize and dump bombs on mm -hmm. people if you do not know their names yeah. and you know nothing more about them and you do not wish to know more about them. Mm -hmm. I grew up during World War II mm -hmm. and I also then spent years in Hawaii and we had a, a long history of hurt but also forgiveness based on the rounding up and and the encampments mm -hmm. for our Japanese population in Hawaii after Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. They were Japs. Mm -hmm. They were bad. Mm -hmm. And it's that same sort of thing. When you don't have a name for it, you can dismiss it, you can hate it, mm -hmm. you can have no interest or tenderness yeah. toward it. Mm -hmm. um, and, but when you have a name, <laughs> you start to wonder about it. You care about it. You, you protect it. Yeah. And, and you want to, I feel like you want, you want to tell people that knowledge too, it becomes <laughs> contagious. Like, did you know this pink salamander has a smile on its face? You know, that kind of thing. And right. I had people tell me that too, that they had never heard of the axolotl. And then just, you know, my book came out in September of 2020 and they have seen axolotl t-shirts or um, really? having oh. a backpack. Like they had somehow never noticed it before, but now they're seeing it kind of more often. And and you know, and it's and it's not because of my book. It's just they're paying attention. They're paying attention. Like, what is that? So they could go on their their mm -hmm. day and see someone with a, a backpack with a pink smile on it, and then take a, a double take and say, "Wait a minute, that's an axolotl. That's not just a pink smiley face of a monster." You know, which is what many of them. Uh -huh. That's right. It's a monster, or it's got to be some sort of cartoon. Uh -huh. not that the actual, um, you know, salamander. So mm -hmm. yeah, people and were like that with the narwhal too. When the narwhal was one of the first things I wrote in the book and now there's narwhal socks, there's narwhal, I don't know, wallpaper. And have you seen narwhals around uh, Michaela? Mm -hmm. like, um, oh yeah, there, I mean, the, the one that comes to mind is from Elf where oh, yeah, it's yeah. an animated one. <laughs> and yeah so again my book is not the first thing at all to point mm -hmm. out i think people just start to notice mm -hmm. when you get to mm -hmm. know about an animal you start realizing oh my gosh there's a narwhal in that commercial there's a narwhal in this cartoon you know that kind of thing it so, has a name it has existence for exactly. you which raises which raises a, a wonderful metaphysical question mm -hmm about unperceived existence. And, and you mentioned this in relation to the dancing frogs. Mm. You said one of the things, um, well, now you introduced me to, um, to the name herpetologists also, I appreciated that. Mm. But you said that herpetologists have discovered 14 new species of frog. Oh. And you said that that's a small ray of hope, but also a fear of unnamed extinctions, mm -hmm. meaning that more kinds of dancing frogs might become extinct before they've ever had a chance to be discovered. Yeah. We, we'd lose their unique connection to 85 million years of evolution, which raises that question. If something 
has not been discovered and named, mm -hmm. does it exist? Mm. Gosh, that's such a good question. I mean, I think absolutely, right? I mean, I think I have to believe one of the, you know, most astonishing facts that still, um, if I think about it too much, I will actually have insomnia over it is that 5% you know, of the ocean's creatures that we've named 5%, what? Um, it's overwhelming and yet it, it fills me with so much awe, with so much gratitude, mm -hmm fear and worry you know um of course there's things that are around there that we don't know that are that we're missing already you know that and i in some ways you know um i have, a, I have a, a poem about this in some ways i kind of hope to not discover more and stuff like i want to say just keep <laughs> hiding like don't show don't show yourself to the humans because we keep messing things up you know like keep hiding um <laughs> Uh -huh. Don't show yourself now in 2021. You know, there's just a, a been a, a terrible uh -huh. new spill um, in the Pacific, and who knows what has been destroyed with that. You know, um, so. Well, you said yeah. that with the oxalotl, mm. uh, and and I do want you to tell us more about that if they haven't read it about the regenerative qualities mm -hmm. and properties of the axolotl. I mean, this is speak of astonishment that you have in here, but you also had a devastating um, part where you said that there are no more mm -hmm. axolotl in the wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, um, oh yeah, go ahead. Can answer that, that metaphysical question. Mm -hmm. Yes, we say, of course they exist, mm -hmm. but in my world, no. Yeah. They don't exist mm. if I don't have a name for it, if I don't know it. Yeah. And so there's that question mm. in the physical world. Yeah. You know, the human world. Yeah. With the axolotl in particular, um, and again, you know, so you can see I, I chose these animals very carefully. Um, yes that these were the ones that I could have done an entire book on and just mm -hmm. an entire meditation on the axolotl. And, and no mean, by no means, I'm not um, uh, a scientist. I don't claim to be, but it's because I have so many questions about it and so many things to think about with the axolotl that, you know, on the one hand, they are a very popular um, aquatic pet right now. Mm which I have mixed feelings about, right? On the one hand, I'm so glad. There's so many schools. I didn't have it, but um, I know several of my friends' is children. It's a, it's a popular class pet. Like whose turn is it to feed the axolotl and things like that. So they learn how to take care of something through this extinct animal in the wild, extinct in the wild animal. I don't know then if those teachers tell them that, you know, and, and what that does to a, six-year-old you know like oh there's no more they don't they don't live naturally in the wild because of humans um and yet the ones that do know that fact about axolotls i think know how precious they are and how it's it should serve as a wake-up call and as a red flag you know like look at what humans have done and um and 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 then on the other hand Scientists are also using axolotl's regenerative properties mm -hmm. to learn how to make skin grafts that really mimic and help um, um, human skin cells and save lives, save human lives at the same time. You know, and I mentioned this in the chapter, it's a very yeah. grisly, it's a grisly thing. And I, I'd be the biggest hypocrite to say, no, we shouldn't do that because I'm not a vegetarian, you know, that kind of thing. I'm not vegan. And so um, I have mixed feelings. I also believe that it saves lives, but at what cost? You know, I mean, it's very complex. There's no way I'm still grappling with it right. clearly. But there are scientists who, you know, to, to get these trials approved, you have to prove that it, it can work a hundred times or so, you know, so this poor axolotl is getting its arms and its tail and, you know, pieces of its, its side just sliced off 
taking notes and then slice it out just when it's growing again oh that gets sliced off and that gets sliced off oh, what are we doing you know i mean and of course there's all kinds of testing on on animals it becomes this big ethical question but and i don't have the answers i don't know and my answer will probably if i did have an answer it would probably change next month but i just thought it should give us at least pause. It should give us at least pause to see what's going on. What are we doing to other animals? And, and you know, and, and you can decide from there. I, again, I, I want this to be, you catch more flies with honey. And I, this is born from a place of love. This was not, there's many environmental books that shame people, that inspire fear. And those are good, those are, you know, they serve the purpose well. I just know that I don't react well in my own life when someone tries to scare me or talk angrily to me. Mm -hmm. I, that's mm -hmm. not how I become an activist. I become an act for me. And again, this is just me. I'm not saying you have to be this way. Um, I react. I take out my checkbook. I take out, you know, I, I, I want to do marching when I see something that I love is being hurt. Mm -hmm. That's how I react is I don't, I don't react well when someone's like, Amy, the climate change is happening and you're going to, you know, Miami, Florida is going to sink in five years. And da, da, da. I get almost like too overwhelmed and just want to hide under the covers and not do anything because it's just like, what's the point? But the ways that I feel like I can be activated to want to, to make a change um, is when I get so inspired by something that I love or get excited by. And this is where that you're, you're that original statement that all that you write about, all of your works are about wonder and love, love and wonder. But you've also used the word contagious a couple mm -hmm. of times. And I think this is critical to what you're saying because what you're writing and what you demonstrate in front of your classes when they first, when you first encounter them and they first encounter you, some of them probably sit back and say, wow, what was that? Yeah. Because unbridled enthusiasm and joy and contagious excitement about things that are not popularly um, known or endorsed or even noticed is peculiar, is weird, and it's a kind of weirdness that is gradually magnetic. Mm. It is contagious. Mm -hmm. The joy of wonder, the joy of love and tenderness and connectedness creates a hunger mm -hmm. in them. And that's where your book has gained such huge popularity. What was it named by Barnes and Noble? The, the, <laughs> the book of the year, basically. The book of the year, exactly. It sounds so ridiculous to say it out loud. And I still am just like, it doesn't make any sense because Barbara, when I tell you how many people rejected this and yes. they were like, no, this, we can't sell this. No one's going to go exactly. for this. And, you know, it's just hard to say. Um, and you actually have it published by an independent press. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm actually so thrilled for that because they gave it so much love and attention and care uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and they were willing to take a risk on it. You know, yeah. there wasn't anything like it before. Um, they didn't try to make me want, to, uh, they didn't want me to be modeling myself after a white male writer who's been dead for 200, you know, for years. And um, they were so visionary in that and they weren't out to make you know, they weren't, they weren't saying like, how do we, you know, I mean, of course, every publisher wants to make money. They don't want to be in the red, but that was not their uh -huh. goal. They really wanted to bring different stories told by people who had not had their stories told before. Um, and I'm, I'm so grateful to Milkweed for that, um, for just championing um, 
diversity on all counts, you know, um, not just racial diversity, but um, different sexualities, different physical abilities, um, different economic backgrounds, different educational backgrounds. You don't have to be a professor um, of a certain class to publish mm -hmm. with milkweed. And I guess now they get to laugh all the way to the bank. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I say that just so cheekily only because Oh my gosh, Barbara, if I, if you just saw how many rejections I got and some of the cruel things that people mm -hmm, would mm -hmm. say, like, this is too, it's like what you said, too much happiness, too much joy. Uh, do you think oh. you, you have any addictions in your family? Can you write that in? Uh, and it was like addictions. Oh. Like, uh, I'm addicted to soap and stationery and that's it, you know? Um, so they were willing to spend and help market it if there was Asian American trauma, but not Asian American joy. And that mm -hmm. is, or love, and that is the tenet, the core of everything that I do. And just mm -hmm. to speak on what you said before, um, yeah, it, I think you're right. I mean, and many students, not all, but many students don't know what, you know, they're encountering when they first uh, show up to one of my classes because they're taught not that you know they're ta they're taught that enthusiasm is not cool anymore they're taught that you'll get made fun of if you express astonishment anymore if you let yourself wonder anymore but you know what uh -huh. you don't kids you never have to teach kids how to wonder or to be curious they are and they express astonishment you know if you're just around right. any any child under 8 um, or even under 10, they'll, they'll almost always say like, look, mom, look at the moon, look at this tree, look at this rock, look at this dirt, you know, it's so red, mm -hmm. red or something like that. Like something happens where we are kind of beaten into submission that that's not mm -hmm. cool anymore to be astonished over a flower or the mm -hmm. way the stars look at night, you know, and many of us, I think many, many of you in the museum industry never were like that. You, you were always able to appreciate beauty and, um, and things like that. But it's what I, what I like to say is that it's never too late to go back to that kid-like wonder and astonishment um, because that's how we survive. That's how we survive during a pandemic. That's how we survive when we have leaders who want to make, to, you know, to take that wonder and curiosity out of our lives. Mm -hmm um anyway and and it's how it's how we be it's how we stay human you can tell in five seconds of talking with another person if they're even curious about anything besides themselves in the five seconds you can tell that you know um and i find that the people who don't have wonderment or curiosity in their life they're also the ones who are so easy to make rules and regulations on any difference, they're, they're teaching others to be afraid of difference, that if you don't, you know, yeah. if, you, if, if you step outside the lines at all, you are something to be afraid of or to distrust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're different, if your body or the way you love is different from them, they will distrust or fear you. You know, mm -hmm. that's, you okay. don't fall for that if you're curious. Amy, you've experienced the, that in your life though. Oh, sure, sure. And, and I also, I laughed when you said you can tell within five seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so something I'm curious yeah. about is no. um, if anyone in the, who's participating has any questions for Amy. So <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, Amy, no, you're doing wonderful. Another Barbara. six you, hours, couldn't we? This, this conversation <laughs> is so wonderful. I love this. Um, but the Q&A is currently empty. So please, if you're, are, you're in the participants, oh. please go into the Q&A, ask your questions. And uh, Barbara, you can keep asking your questions. For the okay, time. I'm, I'm going to um, give you a complete shift of subjects now. Right. You know, we're talking, now, I'm aware that in your book, it is not sugar-coated. It's not all joy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a wonderfully sensitive balance. Mm. of times that were very painful for you and um, creatures who portray qualities that hit buttons mm. in our experience memories mm. and we think oh 
Yeah. But one thing that, that I, I wanted you to speak to, and, and I'm thinking particularly of the cockatiel mm. story. You, you're speaking of wonder and you're speaking of love, but you also speak of loss and grief mm -hmm. and, and pain and in, well, in the cockatiel story, it's about your parents. And well, you tell it, you tell it better than I do. And, and don't forget the part where your mother throws the toy <laughs> into your father's lap in the car when he's weeping. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, mean, so, I mean, you just, but, but my question, my question is, are grief and delight mutually exclusive? Can they, if you are suffering grief, and a loss, can you still have moments of wonderment and joy? Mm. And particularly in the times that we're going through now, this is a time of great stress, of loss, of uncertainty, of danger for many people. And, and does that close down or preclude cultivating wonder? Yeah. That became a complex question, didn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah it's, it's a terrific question. And, and each, each question is worthy of like a whole lecture's worth of um, of an answer. So, uh, but in the interest of time, I, I guess I would say, oh, for sure, um, grief and wonderment are absolutely tied together because, well, um, for several reasons, but for sure, uh, we experience grief when, I mean, the, the most basic thing, we experience grief when we are sad that the thing that we love is gone, you know, or that we're not able to mm -hmm. experience it, you know, so be it a, during a pandemic, so many of us were steeped in grief by not being able to see our loved ones, um, decreased human contact, you know, that kind of thing. That's a direct result of having loved and interacted and touched and hugged and traveling, um, all those good things that we love. And then suddenly that's taken away. So absolutely, to you, they're they're intertwined, and um, that's still on the human level, though. Yeah, for sure. also nature. Mm -hmm. Like when you're when you're weeping mm -hmm. in grief, is it? Can you go? Oh, there's a cardinal on the windowsill. I mean, I don't, I don't know for each one or, of you, but I know. you have to like, apologize. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, know what I mean. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think it's such an individual answer. I mean, absolutely. I think, <laughs> you know, I mean, I lost my grandmother last yes. year during the pandemic. Um, I still haven't been able to fully process that. And she, I haven't mm -hmm. been able to go visit her um, grave in India uh, because of the pandemic. And yet I have so many, and that's also on a human level as well. But um, even during the first, when we knew that we were probably going to lose her within a week and trying to Zoom with her, you know, and that kind of thing, I'm so mm -hmm. grateful. You know, at the time I was so angry at technology. I, I was so sick of Zoom. And that was one instance I was so glad to have that. I was able to kind of see and be at her funeral because of Zoom, which wasn't even around, you know, I don't know how many years ago. So, um, and yet at the same time, I noticed in the background, you know, I could see her cinnamon plants and different butterflies and, um, pe you know, peacocks. Um, I could absolutely appreciate that. At the same time, have a, a heart full of grief. I think with these plants and animals, you know, the cassowary, 
um, that I read about one of the scariest birds I've actually never seen in person before. I have so much tenderness and grief about this bird that I've never even met just because mm -hmm. I know so much about him and about, about it. Um, I was going to meet and be able to, you know, um, interact from a safe distance from with a cassowary in Atlanta and that cassowary um, passed away in 2020 as well. So I wasn't able to travel anyway, but so now the, the only one, there's one in San Diego Zoo. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you have to be going to New Guinea on the other side of the planet to see them. Uh -huh. And yet, because I know there's such a rare bird, I can be in awe and astonishment of them and also hold so much grief that mm -hmm. humans have destroyed so much of their land, run them over constantly, um, you know, and at the same time, be amazed at their bright blue. If you've never seen their face, they're bright royal blue and red. Mm -hmm. um, and they're terrifying, you know. I call, you know, people call them the last living dinosaur. Uh, they really, if you look at their feet, they, you, you absolutely will not doubt that at all. Um, so yeah, grief and awe can uh -huh. absolutely exist at the, at the same time. Yeah. What else? There's other questions here coming up. What else? Oh, good. Um, okay, yeah. nice. So we have two questions. Um, the first is they're both from Marlene. So the first one I'll ask is, what kind of support are you be being given for the youth and teen market? Hmm. Support, you mean like uh, Marlene, I guess, um, support, like what kinds of things I'm doing for teens or support yeah. book? Yeah, for answer it. We'll answer it that way. Okay. Um, well, I go in, it's a, it's a little bit limited right now because of the pandemic. Normally I would be doing class visits where I lead them on nature writing walks, that kind of thing. Right now it's been virtual. So for example, um, last week I just did a visit with um, Exeter, um, a private prep school and where the entire ninth grade was reading this book. Um, and then, you know, um, I was uh, next year, the entire state of Indiana is gonna be reading this book as the common read thing. So. <laughs> Um, that's not a teen program necessarily, but I just wanted to showcase like it's a very um, it's kind of like what you said, Barbara, is that you, it goes from it's I, I like to say that it's like smiling with a machete, like it's <laughs> for middle school for sure. Uh -huh. um, and I think it draws teens in. But as you sit with it or you, you know, let it percolate a little bit more, you realize there's um, a lot more uh, to it, you know. Um, but if I started with the heavy stuff, teens would have been like, no, I don't want to hear about, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. save the planet. OK, yeah. I know, you know, but why, you know. And so so that's kind of been um, I love talking to teen audiences. Um so I, and I, it wasn't marketed as a, as a YA book at all, but I've been so pleased to know, and se several high schools have adopted it as like, mm -hmm. a, I don't know what it's called, common read for the, for their grade or for the mm -hmm. entire class or to read for an A, you know, um, uh, for science, you know, that kind of thing, mm -hmm. just, just to get different, really because they haven't seen a book like that. And frankly, they, uh, some teachers are just tired of teaching the same old, same old environmental mm -hmm. books or nature mm -hmm. books, you know, and there's so many personal narratives from my teen years there. Yes. So it yes. seems like a no brainer. Um, and yet, you know, um, Nevada was like that too. Nevada and the state of Indiana, and I don't have relatives or connections really necessarily mm -hmm. in either of those states. So it's been amazing to see just how, um, how it's been embraced. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it, it'll be exciting to see what Indiana, what programs Indiana has for it too. I feel slightly nervous, like, you know, sorry for the kids who are being forced to read my book, but then, oh. then I get such wonderful feedback after, you know. Yeah. That's wonderful. I'm so glad. Or, yeah, I don't want it to be a chore for people. Yeah, I'm so glad your book is making so many connections with, you know, the schools. That's great. Thank you. I mean, it's the kind of book that I would have done. Are you kidding? I would have loved to have seen someone who has crushes and loves the outdoors. Like, I just didn't know that that was possible. We had like Stoic mm -hmm. Rowe or John Muir who just left his family to mm -hmm. go camping with Teddy Roosevelt. And it's like, right. what? What does your wife think about all this? You know? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I, I it just would have, I would have loved to read. And those are important, great books that helped and shape and, and move, move me. 
but I think it's also 2021 and we should also have so in, in addition to Thoreau and Muir, we should have some other books as well. Absolutely. So this other question from Marlene is, can we expect another book soon and on what? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I am working on another book. I feel a little superstitious talking about it, but this one is for kids. And there is one for grownups that is coming. It's still kind of percolating, but it's funny you mentioned, Barbara. Um, part of it is like kind of a natural history of snakes. Um, so, and which, which terrify me overall, you know, too, but I've come to kind of like them from afar. <laughs> so that, uh, it's exploring that. It's, it's exploring this notion of beauty and snakes. And that's all I'll say about that. But the project I'm working on that's, a, that's almost complete is, um, a, a, is a middle grade book for kids. Uh -huh. Great. But Amy, as you begin naming the snakes, Mm -hmm. doesn't that change how you feel about oh, yeah. a particular for sure, of the for group? sure. all of a it's, sudden if yeah you see, um you know a coral spotted green grass snake mm -hmm. that yeah, there's a tenderness there there's a yeah. called the boom slang i'm writing that down <laughs> i just love that that's the name of a snake the boom slang boom how can how can you hate a snake called the boom sling, you know? Oh. So we have about 15 minutes left until it's eight o'clock and we'll wrap it up. But Barbara, you can ask more questions. People in the audience, if you have more questions for Amy, please use the Q&A. No question is too big or too small. These yeah. are great. Do we have some more questions from the audience? If, do we have any? No, we don't currently. <laughs> Sorry, okay. my desk was up. Well, I certainly have more. <laughs> Um, well, I I have I have a question about the end. Well, uh, about the the structuring within the book itself. Okay. There are some there are some essays that seem to um, lock into each other. Hmm. Velcro. Mm -hmm. And there are others that are like magnets that repel each other. Sure. Your choice of placement happened how? Mm. Intuitively? Did it just echo inside you to do it that way? Or how? Tell me about that. Yeah. There's yeah. been an observation about the beginning and ending. Okay. okay sure. Yeah, that's such a good question. You know, um, it was very carefully um, arranged. I mean, I, I printed them all out and kind of what mm -hmm. I did with the poetry um, and just laid them out on the floor, at least laid the first page on each on the floor mm -hmm. and of, of a kind of an empty room. And I tried to just say, how is this rubbing up or questioning or mm -hmm. um, arguing with the next one or how does they complement each other, that kind of thing. And I just did that all the way through kept arranging and shuffling things. Uh -huh. The one thing I knew I did not want to do, um, and I had it set like this for a while, um, and until um, one of my dear colleagues and um, a tremendous writer in his own right, Casey Lehman, um, said, you know, why you need to start with, you do not need to do um, chronological order. Uh -huh. So it was, it did start out with um, comb jelly at four years old, all the way to, uh -huh. Um, I think it ended with Firefly, so chronological, but, you know, and I couldn't figure out why I liked that and why it was making more and more sense, and it dawned on me, you know, when I grew up, we, every four years, we had to move somewhere, or about every four years, we had to mm -hmm. move somewhere, so I didn't want to put necessarily a timeline of events, like, first this happened in first grade, then this happened in third grade, mm -hmm. kindergarten, mm -hmm. I'll call it, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I wanted there to be whiplash a little bit with like, wait a minute, we're talking about Kansas here. Now it's an adult. She has kids here. Now she's a kid. Like what's going on? I want that sense of being shaken up a little bit because that's kind of how I was. I was displaced a lot. And also I wanted, I wanted those connections to be made clear that a catalpa I noticed when I was in sixth grade, I see now at my job here at the mm -hmm. University of Mississippi mm -hmm. and that they're caught that 
we're connected. I can't ever run away from Chicago is with me here and Kansas, every, all those places are still a part of me. So I wanted that to be reflected in the organization of the book. Um, in the chapter about the red spotted newt, mm. you say, I look back on the many moves my family made during my childhood, mm -hmm. and I begin to understand the red spotted newt. And near the end of that one, you also, well, at several places, you're talking about the places you have lived. Mm -hmm. And at one place you say, but that wasn't my forever home. Mm. And in talking about this red spotted newt, would you talk about that wandering and that homing aspect of the red spotted newt, how, how he wanders and wanders mm -hmm. until he finds his home. He wanders yeah. a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the and, and where you are now. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. And, you know, um, this is my fifth year here now in Mississippi. And um, as I mentioned in the red spotted newt, while Western New York was, you know, that's where um, my children were born. Um, that's where I got married. Um, it'll always have a special place mm -hmm. for me as well. And yet at the same time, at least towards the end of my time there, um, something just felt off. Um, and I don't know how to explain it. It's not the fault of Western New York, anything like that, but just like how it is for everybody individually. Um, you just, I think like in real estate, I think a lot of times people say like, you just know this is the right place. Or if you're picking colleges, you just feel it. That's kind of how I felt when I moved to Mississippi. Um, and, you know, newts, red spotted newts have, um, have this homing um, system in them. And again, I am not a scientist, um, but it's, they liken it to electromagnetic um, situation where they kind of, they feel the gravitational pull of the North Pole. So they, that's how they can kind of, no matter if you put them, you know, as far away, a football field far away from their actual nest, they will figure it out. They will find their way back. You know, if you spin them around, they'll find their way home. And so I just kind of love that as kind of a metaphor from um, being in Chicago and Arizona and Kansas and Western New York, Ohio, I was spun around all these places. And then suddenly I never would, out of all the states, out of all the 50 right. states, I never would have pictured Mississippi is the one where I just it felt it in my bones. Uh -huh. with, you know, I, something in me lined up like magnets and, um, and yeah, so uh, that, that just served as a, as, and I'm, I'm so happy that Mississippi agreed with me <laughs> and, and my husband and I work here now and um, my boys, we could all just be outside here again, as much as um, Michaela, I know you love skiing and stuff. It just was never my thing. I love, I mean, it's still 90 degrees here. You can see I'm still wearing a, sun, a sundress. <laughs> um, it's still very much summer. My husband does miss the beautiful western New York fall time and actual sweater weather and things like that he's all about the flannel and you know um the coffee I am happy with it being 90 degrees from you know a good portion of the time but there was a magnetic pull it really was ultimately and, found mm -hmm. you yeah it really was and you know and it's a weird thing I just as a small thing from Mississippi and it's not necessarily a knock against Western New York, but it is it is just the truth. And I didn't know this. I absolutely thought all of Mississippi, um, I don't know if anybody in the audience has seen that movie, A Time to Kill with Matthew McConaughey. Mm -hmm. um, John Grisham is the one who wrote that. I just thought all of Mississippi was like that, just things on fire, crosses burning. And <laughs> I didn't have, I mean, I'm ashamed. I did not have the greatest vision of Mississippi. And I'm pleased to say it is actually such a, um, it's, it's been so welcoming to my family. And I don't get asked here what the dreaded question that has followed me through all these locations, what are you? I think because, I th and I truly think it's because of the really tumultuous time um, and violent time that Mississippi has had with, um, with a, uh, with racial justice um, mm -hmm. and segregation in the past, I think people either, I think kids here are 
have better home training or they've all, and, and, or they also have learned about it. You can't escape learning about this history, uh -huh. you know, um, in ways that I didn't learn about it, the, you know, all, uh -huh. all the things, uh -huh. it was very much blurred over um, in my social studies classes. And again, I'm not pointing fingers or anything, but yeah. for example, my second grader, his, his class field trip was to go to the Lorraine Hotel and stand on the balcony where Martin Luther King was shot in Memphis, which is also like 45 minutes away. So they do not mince words. And I thought, and I was a, a chaperone, and I thought, well, they'll do the gentle version of this story. You know, it's the Civil Rights Museum. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they brought a bunch of second graders out on the very balcony and they said, look over there in that window. That's where um, so and so shot. Dr. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King and the head and the chest. And I could see my, my boy's <laughs> eyes, like, but they, they know, and they're, you know, he has Muslim classmates, white classmates, um, all different economic backgrounds. They know like those are bad, evil, evil people. And what I've been so heartened here in Mississippi to see is that because they learn it so quickly, it's not even acceptable to them to keep doing that. So I, I just, again, no place is perfect. No place is perfect at all. Yeah. There are many happy memories I have of Western New York, but I think it would have been more helpful for, I think some people to learn some of this history mm -hmm. a little bit earlier so that they don't grow up to be this adult, uh, you know, uh, saying namaste in the parking lot of Fredonia's campus or asking me at the post office, what are you? Or when I'm at tops, you know, trying to pick out apples and someone's like, hey, my wife and I have a bet. This actually happened. Um, are you Portuguese or what is, what are you? You know, and it's like, I'm just trying to buy apples at tops. You know, what is what? <laughs> Um, anyway, I, again, no place is perfect. Mississippi definitely has a long way to go on, on other things as well, but yeah. they just, they're kind of in some weird ways better than any place I've ever been at treating differences a little bit mm -hmm. more direct and more, more open. I don't know. It's, it's, I, w I don't know if I would have believed it had I not been here. So right. there you go. I'm just saying this is what I've experienced. And like, like the red spotted newt, you wandered and wandered, mm -hmm. but found it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Totally expected. <laughs> the right magnetic field, and you knew when you got there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, All right. Michaela, do we have any more questions? We don't, but I think okay. that last question really rounded it out. Um, I think that's a really nice place to, to end our book club this evening. Um, thank you so much, Amy, for joining us. Oh, it was so thank lovely. You. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much. I wish that we could all be in the, the lobby of the yeah. <laughs> together and I know. maybe one day in the future. But thank yeah. you, Barbara, for thank amazing you. questions. Thank you yes. all for getting in. Yes, thank thanks. Thank you, Barbara, so much for facilitating. Your questions were so wonderful. Um, so I just have some closing thoughts. So um, tomorrow is Second Friday at the museum. We are free to the public and we are open till seven. We'll have music in the auditorium and art workshops in the galleries. Mm. And we do have a family day at the end of this month on October 30th. We'll have activities in the galleries and upstairs. Costumes are encouraged because it's the day before Halloween. We'll do a little trick or treating in the reception space. So that'll be a really fun event. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you again, Amy, for joining us. This was so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone.